Today's apologists claim the United States is a Christian nation. Christian nationalists often claim that the U.S. is a Christian nation based on Christian principles. Clearly, most Americans today are still Christians, but this nation was not founded on Christianity. In fact, most of the founding fathers were not theistic Christians, but instead deistic Christians, meaning they believed in the moral teachings of Jesus but not his divinity, as well as Unitarians and deists. For this reason, it should come as no surprise that the deistic term nature's God appears in the Declaration of Independence, and the words Jesus and Christianity appear exactly zero times in either the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution. The Founding Fathers were inspired by the philosophy of the Enlightenment popular at the time, and they created a government based on liberty and equality, not Christian authoritarianism. And that included the principle of freedom of and freedom from religion, so that no one could be forced to follow or support a religion they didn't believe in. This meant separation of church and state, so that no single religion would be favored, thus protecting all religious positions equally. Christian nationalists are often quick to point out that the term separation of church and state also doesn't appear in either the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution. That's true. However, the Founding Fathers wrote numerous books, letters, treaties, and other documents clarifying the meaning of our constitutional rights, and that's where we find the term separation of church and state and other words to that effect. For example, Thomas Jefferson, father of the Declaration of Independence, stated, I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people which declared that their legislature should make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. James Madison, father of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, stated, the civil government functions with complete success by the total separation of the church from the state. Every new and successful example of a perfect separation between ecclesiastical and civil matters is of importance. And I have no doubt that every new example will succeed, as every past one has done, in showing that religion and government will both exist in greater purity the less they are mixed together. The purpose of separation of church and state is to keep forever from these shores the ceaseless strife that has soaked the soil of Europe in blood for centuries. So the Founding Fathers strongly believed in the separation of church and state. Furthermore, many of them also made it clear that they did not have a favorable view of Christianity and had no intention of founding the U.S. on Christian principles. What follows is a large collection of important quotes from some of the most famous and influential Founding Fathers on this subject, which should give you a pretty good indication of what they believed. From John Adams, contributor to the Declaration of Independence and Constitution and second President of the United States. The government of the United States of America is not, in any sense, founded on the Christian religion. Treaty of Tripoli, unanimously approved by the U.S. Senate, and signed by President John Adams. The divinity of Jesus is made a convenient cover for absurdity. Nowhere in the Gospels do we find a precept for creeds, confessions, oaths, doctrines, and whole carloads of other foolish trumpery that we find in Christianity. The United States of America have exhibited perhaps the first example of governments erected on the simple principles of nature, it will never be pretended that any persons employed in that service had interviews with the gods or were in any degree under the influence of heaven more than those at work upon ships or houses or laboring in merchandise or agriculture. It will forever be acknowledged that these governments were contrived merely by the use of reason and the senses. From Thomas Jefferson, father of the Declaration of Independence and third president of the United States. Question with boldness even the existence of a God, because, if there be one, he must more approve the homage of reason than that of blindfolded fear. The legitimate powers of government extend to such acts only as are injurious to others, but it does me no injury for my neighbor to say there are twenty gods or no god. It neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg where the preamble declares that coercion is a departure from the plan of the holy author of our religion, an amendment was proposed, by inserting the word Jesus Christ, 
so that it should read, A departure from the plan of Jesus Christ, the holy author of our religion, the insertion was rejected by a great majority in proof that they meant to comprehend within the mantle of its protection the Jew and the Gentile, the Christian and the Mohammedan, the Hindu and the infidel of every denomination. Christianity neither is nor ever was a part of the common law. And the day will come when the mystical generation of Jesus, by the supreme being as his father in the womb of a virgin, will be classed with the fable of the generation of Minerva in the brain of Jupiter. But we may hope that the dawn of reason and freedom of thought in these United States will do away with all this artificial scaffolding and restore to us the primitive and genuine doctrines of this most venerated reformer of human errors. History, I believe, furnishes no example of a priest-ridden people maintaining a free civil government. This marks the lowest grade of ignorance of which their civil as well as religious leaders will always avail themselves for their own purposes. Thomas Paine, influential writer who inspired American independence from Britain. Each of those churches shows certain books which they call Revelation or the Word of God. The Jews say that their word of God was given by God to Moses face to face. The Christians say that their word of God came by divine inspiration. And the Turks say that their word of God, the Quran, was brought by an angel from heaven. Each of those churches accuses the other of unbelief. And, for my part, I disbelieve them all. Take away from Genesis the belief that Moses was the author, on which only the strange believe that it is the word of God as stood, and there remains nothing of Genesis but an anonymous book of stories, fables, and traditionary or invented absurdities, or of downright lies. It appears that Thomas did not believe in a resurrection, and, as they say, would not believe without having ocular and manual demonstration himself. So neither will I, and the reason is equally good for me, and for every other person, as for Thomas. It is a contradiction in terms and ideas to call anything a revelation that comes to us at second hand, either verbally or in writing. Revelation is necessarily limited to the first communication. After this, it is only an account of something which that person says was a revelation made to him. And though he may find himself obliged to believe it, it cannot be incumbent on me to believe it in the same manner. For it was not a revelation made to me, and I have only his word for it that it was made to him. Is it more probable that nature should go out of her course, or that a man should tell a lie? We have never seen, in our time, nature go out of her course, but we have good reason to believe that millions of lies have been told in the same time. It is therefore at least millions to one that the reporter of a miracle tells a lie. That God cannot lie is no advantage to your argument, because it is no proof that priests cannot, or that the Bible does not. The Christian religion is a parody on the worship of the Son, in which they put a man whom they call Christ in the place of the Son, and pay him the same adoration which was originally paid to the Son. The study of theology, as it stands in Christian churches, is the study of nothing. It is founded on nothing, it rests on no principles, it proceeds by no authorities, it has no data, it can demonstrate nothing, and it admits of no conclusion. Not anything can be studied as a science without our being in possession of the principles upon which it is founded. And as this is the case with Christian theology, it is therefore the study of nothing. Science is the true theology. As to the book called the Bible, it is blasphemy to call it the Word of God. It is a book of lies and contradictions, and a history of bad times and bad men. There are but a few good characters in the whole book. That many good men have believed this strange fable, Christianity, and lived very good lives under that belief, for credulity is not a crime, is what I have no doubt of. In the first place, they were educated to believe it, and they would have believed anything else in the same manner. There are also many who have been so enthusiastically enraptured by what they conceive to be the infinite love of God to man in making a sacrifice of himself that the vehemence of the idea has forbidden and deterred them from examining into the absurdity and profaneness of the story. What is it the Bible teaches us? Raping, cruelty, and murder. What is it the New Testament teaches us? 
to believe that the Almighty committed debauchery with a woman engaged to be married, and the belief of this debauchery is called faith. It is from the Bible that man has learned cruelty, rapine, and murder, for the belief of a cruel God makes a cruel man. There are matters in the Bible said to be done by the express commandment of God that are shocking to humanity and to every idea we have of moral justice. The declaration which says that God visits the sins of the fathers upon the children is contrary to every principle of moral justice. Whenever we read the obscene stories, the voluptuous debaucheries, the cruel and torturous executions, the unrelenting vindictiveness with which more than half the Bible is filled, it would be more consistent that we call it the word of a demon than the word of God. It is a history of wickedness that has served to corrupt and brutalize mankind. And, for my part, I sincerely detest it, as I detest everything that is cruel. Among the detestable villains that in any period of the world have disgraced the name of man, it is impossible to find a greater than Moses, if this account be true. Here is an order to butcher the boys, to massacre the mothers, and debauch the daughters. It is far better that we admitted a thousand devils to Rome at large than that we permitted one such impostor and monster as Moses, Joshua, Samuel, and the Bible prophets to come with the pretended word of God and have credit among us. Of all the tyrannies that affect mankind, tyranny in religion is the worst. All national institutions of churches, whether Jewish, Christian, or Turkish, appear to me no other than human inventions set up to terrify and enslave mankind and monopolize power and profit. Persecution is not an original feature in any religion, but it is always the strongly marked feature of all religions established by law. George Washington, Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army, President of the Constitutional Convention, and First President of the United States. If I could now conceive that the general government might ever be so administered as to render the liberty of conscience insecure, I beg you will be persuaded that no one would be more zealous than myself to establish effectual barriers against the horrors of spiritual tyranny and every species of religious persecution. Of all the animosities which have existed among mankind, those which are caused by a difference of sentiments in religion appear to be the most inveterate and distressing, and ought to be deprecated. I was in hopes that the enlightened and liberal policy which has marked the present age would at least have reconciled Christians of every denomination so far that we should never again see the religious disputes carried to such a pitch as to endanger the peace of society. In this enlightened age and in this land of equal liberty, it is our boast that a man's religious tenets will not forfeit the protection of the laws, nor deprive him of the right of attaining and holding the highest offices that are known in the United States. We have abundant reason to rejoice that in this land the light of truth and reason has triumphed over the power of bigotry and superstition. And here are some additional Founding Fathers' views. Benjamin Franklin I have, with most of the present dissenters in England, some doubts as to Jesus' divinity, though it is a question I do not dogmatize upon, having never studied it, and think it needless to busy myself with it now. Lighthouses are more helpful than churches. Ethan Allen, I have generally been denominated a deist, the reality of which I never disputed, being conscious I am no Christian, except mere infant baptism makes me one, and as to being a deist, I know not strictly speaking whether I am one or not. George Mason It is contrary to the principles of reason and justice that any should be compelled to contribute to the maintenance of a church with which their consciences will not permit them to join, and from which they can derive no benefit, for remedy whereof, and that equal liberty as well as religious as civil, may be universally extended to all the good people of this commonwealth. Noah Webster, every interference of the civil power in regulating opinion is an impious attempt to take the business of the deity out of his own hands, and every preference given to any religious denomination is so far slavery and bigotry. Samuel Adams, in regard to religion, mutual toleration in the different professions thereof is what all good and candid minds in all ages have ever practiced, 
and both by precept and example inculcated on mankind. Elbridge Jerry, no religious doctrine shall be established by law. Roger Sherman, Congress has no power to make any religious establishments. Charles Pinckney, the legislature of the United States shall pass no law on the subject of religion. Oliver Ellsworth, some very worthy persons who have not had great advantages for information have objected against that clause in the Constitution which provides that no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. They have been afraid that this clause is unfavorable to religion. But, my countrymen, the sole purpose and effect of it is to exclude persecution and to secure to you the important right of religious liberty. So, in summary, most of the Founding Fathers were Unitarians, Deists, and Deistic Christians, and the United States was not founded on Christian principles.